Okay, we're going to talk about um, GI and GU ultrasound today, and uh, the goal, of course, is try to get you as prepared as possible as we transition from the building that we're currently in here, and as you move from the second year into the third year, which is this building over here, which is the hospital, obviously, and it's not just that building, it's also clinics and wards and the VA and all these other places in Long Beach and stuff. So, uh, but that's the, the concept is going from the classroom to the patient, and that's where this ultrasound stuff fits in. So we're going to quickly transition today into the kidney and also some intestinal structures and the gallbladder. So this is the kidney, and uh, you can see it here in all its splendor and glory. But to, to talk about the different anatomical parts of the kidney, this is the capsule of the kidney out here. And now the capsule is a very rigid structure. And when the kidney expands, it's got nowhere to go. And so it causes the patient a lot of pain if the kidney gets obstructed. For example, when the urine tries to make itself out the ureter, if the ureter is obstructed by a kidney stone, the kidney can't really expand. And so that's what causes such terrible colicky pain. So that thick capsule is out here. This is all the cortex of the kidney here. We can see the cortex all the way around here. And this is the, the sinus or pelvis of the kidney, this hypoechoic or anechoic area. Recall that hyperechoic means bright, hypoechoic means dark, and anechoic means black. And uh, just to kind of, in a schematic, remind you of these details, this is the capsule out here. Again, this is the renal cortex out here. And this is the renal pyramid. These renal pyramids all come together, coalesce together to drain the urine into the renal pelvis, sometimes called the renal sinus, which then drain out the ureter. Now, normally, uh, the kidney uh, is, is the, the cortex of the kidney is over here less echogenic than the next door neighbor, which is the liver or the spleen on the left side. Can you make out the fact that this renal cortex is slightly less echogenic than this organ right here? That's the goal, okay? If you can see that, then you can appreciate the subtleties of gain. So that's exactly what happened, right? This is an image here that's overgained. And as novices, we tend to want to overgain the machine to see it better, you know? And also when we're in a brightly lit room, um, right now, the this room is perfect for ultrasound, the, the lights are nicely dim, but we're in a brightly lit room. The tendency is to turn up the gain. I see this a lot in my trauma bay where every single light in the hospital seems to be on. And so people tend to overgain the image. But look what happens though, you can wash out this image and now it's really difficult to see how the cortex of the kidney is less echogenic than the liver because the gain is too high. So how do we adjust the gain? Well, that's this uh, rotary knob right here on the Sonocyte S device. You're going to turn that counterclockwise, and as we do so, we take this severely overgained image here down to this. Now this is a nice level of gain where I can easily see that the cortex of this kidney is less echogenic than this liver parenchyma here is. So this is a hepatic vein coursing through the liver. It's anechoic. It also doesn't have any walls to it. It's got very thin walls, which you don't see on ultrasound. We just see a black line running through the liver. And this very hypercoke structure, anybody know what that is? That's the diaphragm. I hear people whispering it very good. There's a the diaphragm right there. So if I had to rank everything on the screen in terms of their levels of echogenicity, and that's a fun question of mine to ask, is rank the fall in terms of their echogenicity. Number one would be the diaphragm. Number two would be the renal sinus. Number three would be the liver. Number four would be the renal cortex. And then number five, the least echogenic structure would be the hepatic vein. Make sense? I'm just trying to get you to think about some of the art of this. We're going to move on now. How do you actually scan the kidney? Very simple. You go ahead and place the probe either in a coronal or an anterior location and um, get the kidney on the screen in that fashion. Or you can uh, turn the, um, the probe into a more posterior approach back here, looking between the ribs posteriorly. And it all depends on the patient's body habitus, um, kind of how their organs uh, fall into place. Sometimes you get better views coronally, sometimes you get better views posteriorly. And um, we can see this image over here is the kidney. Here's the kidney cortex here. Here's the organ next door to it, which happens to be the liver on the right side of the body. And we lose the lower pole of the kidney. 
First of all, how do I know that this is the lower pole and that this is the upper pole? Well, the reason I know that is because I've got the probe indicator pointed towards the patient's head. So therefore, everything on this side of the screen is towards the head and everything over here is towards the feet. But look at this loop of bowel coming along here, air being the enemy of ultrasound. It's blocking the lower pole of my kidney, and so we're losing all that information. So what we do instead is we move the probe more posteriorly. Now we can see the entire kidney on one view when we take that posterior approach, which, you know, on the right side isn't that big of a deal. I can still make out this lower pole of the kidney, pretty much almost all of it there. But on the left side, because the spleen isn't as big, we lose a lot more of that lower pole of the kidney. So on the left side, I find myself going more posteriorly more often to pick up the entire kidney on that left side. One of the things we see around the kidney a lot is fat. So this is just normal perinephric fat. You guys may remember this from last year with your cadavers. This is, our eye is drawn to things naturally that are bright on the ultrasound screen. So everybody always looks at this and um, they get kind of excited about it, but really it's just visceral fat around the kidney. There's nothing to get excited about. When we look at a kidney, we're really looking, we're kind of breaking it up into whether we see something out in the cortex or we see something that's where the collecting system is or the, what I, what's also called the renal pelvis or the renal sinus. We also refer to that sort of as the collecting system. So if something is out in the cortex and it's anechoic and it's spherical in all dimensions, well, then it's a renal cyst. But if you see anechoic stuff in the center or the pelvis of the kidney, that's hydronephrosis. That's fluid building up in the kidney. And this is what hydronephrosis looks like. It's just a little bit of a glove-like formation when you get back to the kidney. See how it kind of splays out a little bit? In the center, there's the pelvis and the fingers of the glove kind of go out towards its cortex. That's a little bit of mild hydronephrosis there. It's just barely even noticeable. But you move on, you see a little bit more. See, we, we can see the fingers of the glove kind of going out into these different projections. They eventually all coalesce, but not until we get to right at the renal sinus does it coalesce down here. So that's another bit of, I would say, mild amount of hydronephrosis. It's a very nebulous grading category, um, but here it's sort of splaying out a little bit, sort of mild. We can still make out plenty of cortex. This is all cortex out here. There's plenty of cortex left in that kidney. When we have a, a stone, or in this case we have a couple of stones here in this kidney, we know that they're stones because they exude a shadow all the way to the bottom of the screen. You see that? So sometimes you'll see stuff that's hyperechoic but doesn't shadow. But when, when you get a shadow that goes all the way to the bottom of the screen that way, you can confirm that that's from a very dense calcified structure. The sound's getting reflected off that shadow. And in this case, it's from renal lithiasis or kidney stones. This is an example here of a renal cyst. Notice that it's out in the cortex of the kidney. This is the liver. This is the kidney. We're losing the lower pole from all this bowel gas. But as we get out, we can actually see a cyst up here, and then there's another little cyst down here. Here's that cyst towards the upper pole over here. And no matter how you rotate the probe, from transverse to coronally, the cyst is always spherical and anechoic in all planes. This is what happens when we get a really a lot of hydronephrosis backing up in the kidney. Our cortex is starting to go away, and all those finger-like projections are now coalescing to one large hypo or anechoic area here seen in the pelvis of the kidney, and that's more like moderate hydronephrosis. When all those fingers kind of come together, we can still make out the cortex, though. See out here, we can still see cortex. If all I saw was a big black center where the kidney should be, and there's no cortex left, it's very, very rare, but that would be severe hydronephrosis. The fact that I can still make out cortex to me tells me this is probably moderate. You heard of polycystic kidney disease? This is what it looks like on ultrasound. These are all these cysts seen out here in the cortex. We can make that one here, this one here, this one here, this one down here. Polycystic kidneys, and it's bilateral. And you can see it also affect other organs. Sometimes you can see cysts in the spleen. You see them around the liver. Ovaries look like this when they have polycystic disease. Okay, now let's say that the kidneys are functioning normally. They're pumping the urine down into the bladder, and you want to know how much urine is in the bladder. Well, we can measure that on ultrasound. We can look at a kidney in two dimensions and measure the three dimensions of it, and then we can get a bladder estimation of the bladder volume that way.
So right now we've got the probe in a transverse plane with the indicator of the patient's right. Therefore, this is the height and this is the width, right? So this is going from one edge of the bladder to the other edge, and this is going from the top of the bladder to the bottom of the bladder. So we can input these, and some machines will allow you to do this. D1 got entered, now we're entering D2, which we're gonna call the width. So it was the height, and then we got the width, and then we ch change the plane from transverse, we unfreeze the machine, and we move the probe into a sagittal plane, where now we have the length of the bladder here. So those are the three dimensions, height, width, and length. And you can enter these into some machines, or you can just multiply these values uh, to each other, and you should estimate the bladder volume that way. Questions about that? This, this one had like 437 cc's in it. Yes? When would you want to measure the bladder volume? Yeah, like why do you care about measuring the bladder volume? Um, it's, it's something that we want to know about actually quite frequently in the hospital because at all ages. In little babies, we want to know whether or not, um, who have a fever, we want to check their uh, bladder for any, um, we want to basically cannulate their bladder, put a catheter into their bladder to get the urine out, to send it off for urine culture. Well, some of them just urinated in their diaper and you would unnecessarily put them through the procedure of a bladder catheterization, which is painful. So you could avoid unnecessarily, you have to wait until the bladder fills up basically. So I train my nurses to do this, and they take a peek at the bladder before they bother putting a catheter into a small child. Um, the other thing is, on the other end of the spectrum, somebody comes in with acute urinary retention. They say, hey doc, I haven't peed in like, you know, 24 hours. And it's really easy to just say, okay, chuck a Foley in that guy, you know, like throw a, throw a catheter in that guy, and then tell me what comes out, which is sort of an easy thing to tell a nurse to do. But what if the bladder is empty because they're actually in acute renal failure and they just underwent, uh, in an adult patient, it's extremely uncomfortable to put somebody through a catheterization process. So it's one of the five most uh, painful things I do to patients in my ER is put a catheter in their, in their, through their urethra into their bladder. So I like to look first to see what's going on, to see if I've got a bladder full of urine or if it's an empty bladder, I won't put them through that process. Okay, so that's, and also to see how well the, um, the kidneys are functioning. We can look at the bladder to assess jets and stuff. There's a whole host of things I can see in the bladder, bladder diverticulums, bladder uh, tumors and masses and thickening of the bladder wall consistent with cystitis. But, uh, but just to measure the, the urine, there's also something called a post-void residual. And somebody who has an enlarged prostate, they, go vo they, they, they think they've emptied their bladder, but instead, we have 400 cc's left in the bladder after somebody attempts to void their bladder. Well, their post-void residual 400 cc's, that's a lot of good information to pass along to um, a specialist like a urologist about. And, and we can also measure their prostate too on bladder. So on transabdominal bladder ultrasound, so we can measure the dimensions of their prostate. So measuring the prostate and, and having that post-void residual is uh, in many different um, locations, whether you're in the outpatient clinic, you're in the ER, you're in the ICU, those are all good information to have about your patient. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. We're going to switch gears now and talk about the bowel, okay? Now, you talk about ultrasound of the bowel. Well, first, right off the bat, I know that you know who the enemy of ultrasound is, right? Who's the enemy of ultrasound? Air. Air. Bowel gas, generally speaking. Um, and so that's the problem. We have the enemy of ultrasound being the bowel gas. And in some patients, it's, uh, it's pretty significant how much bowel gas they can have, right? So that's why we have to somehow overcome that enemy. Now, in a guy like this, I don't know if there's anything I could do to actually examine his bowel using ultrasound because he's just so at the end of that spectrum of, of bowel distension. But, um, but in other patients, though, we can, we can get through and see their intestines actually quite easily, even when they have a lot of pathology, which I'll show you here in a second. So we're going to be talking about bowel obstructions, where the gas is located, and appendicitis in this quick little um, demonstration. So generally speaking, to insinate the intestines, what you want to use is you want to use the linear probe, okay? Now I know that what you're thinking, the linear probes for structures that are superficial, and that's high frequency. However, when you start to use this, you're, what you're going to do is you're going to use a compression technique to look at the intestines. You're going to push down on the abdomen using that linear probe. And that basically, what that does is, as you compress the abdominal wall, you are decreasing the effective focal point of that transducer, meaning that 
you can actually get away with using linear probe with the intestine because you're pushing down so hard that structures that used to be far away are now much closer to your probe. For example, you're trying to find the psoas muscle, which is down by the spine, a deep structure. However, when you compress the skin four, five, six centimeters down into the body, well, now you can take advantage of the fact that you're so close to those structures that you can use this linear probe, which is why, for the most part, this is my transducer of choice. Now, if I did have a very large patient like that guy we just saw, certainly I'd be leaning towards using one of my lower frequency curvilinear probes, hopefully one with a large footprint like the C60, but that being said, the linear transducer can usually get through a lot of this intestinal ultrasound. And what we're going to do is we're going to do something called mowing the lawn. And what that means is we are going to start in the right upper quadrant and find the ascending colon. That's where it always is, right up there in the right upper quadrant. We can tell it's ascending colon because it's got haustra. Recall that haustra are little indentations in the bowel wall that don't cross all the way across the, the midline to the other wall. They're just like little sections that are sectioned off. Whereas in the small bowel, we have something called plique circularis that do cross the entire wall of the bowel, which I'll show you in a minute. That's kind of how we quickly can decide between small bowel and large bowel on any imaging study, looking at haustra versus plique circularis. That sounds like it's minutia, but actually it's, that comes into play quite a bit in most fields, so something you might want to remember. You're going to follow that ascending colon. First I go down to the right lower quadrant, looking around where the appendix would be, okay? And the cecum's got a blind-ended loop down there, and that's the location where you'll find the terminal ilium and the appendix will pop right off the terminal ilium. And do I always see those structures? No, but I know that that's where they're supposed to be. And really what I'm doing, especially when it comes to appendicitis, is I'm looking for a non-compressible tubular structure down there. I'll get into that in a minute. But once you get down there, then you can follow the, the continue mowing the lawn by going back up, back up the ascending colon, across the transverse, and then down the descending portions of the colon and you're basically following that all the way down to the sigmoid, down into the pelvis. That's where you can take a peek at the uh, urinary bladder. And, um, and that's sort of the overall process. You do that in a transverse plane like we've outlined here with this magic marker. And then you would do the same thing in a sagittal plane going side to side rather than up and down. And that's kind of how I think of it. When I'm doing a focused appendicitis exam, which is I do quite often in the ER, I keep this mowing the lawn technique just around the right lower quadrant where the appendix is located down there, what we call McBurney's point. Or sometimes just hand the transducer to the patient and I say, put this where the pain is. And, um, and then they start to push it on their abdominal wall and they kind of lo help, help to localize where I should start my search for their etiology of their pain. Normal intestine kind of looks like this. Um, it's got a layered appearance, it's easily compressible, and it should intermittently peristalse. And the large intestine's wall is less than four millimeters. And small intestine, everybody argues about it, but it's less than four millimeters also, probably closer to being less than three millimeters, but it's definitely thinner than the large intestine is. And um, just keep in mind that on ultrasound, the colon has that typical haustra, and um, that right hemicolon is usually filled with stool and gas, whereas the left hemicolon is usually found in a somewhat contracted condition. Now, as you can see here, this is abnormal intestine. How do I know that? Well, I measured the wall thickness. We measure from the outside edge of the wall all the way down to where the lumen starts here. And this is where the lumen is here. This is like stool and feces and a little bit of air. These little punctate things here, that's probably air. Whenever I see dots on the screen, those are almost always air. And so the wall actually extends right to where the lumen starts. Okay, so over here the wall would start here all the way down to where the lumen starts. In fact, down here the lumen starts right about here. Okay, so this is abnormal when we see it thickened like this. We, we had the loss of that layered appearance. It's kind of hanging out by itself. It's no longer compressible. That's another thing. Normal intestine should be nicely compressible. And if you look around the edges of this, stuff that's inflamed always appears hyperechoic, very bright. We can see around the edges of the structure here, it's got these hyperechoic areas. And when I compress them, um, there exudes this mass effect. It all kind of moves together as one unit. Now, intestines should easily flop around each other and slip around each other and should slide amongst one another. When there's um, inflammation or ab abnormality there, then um, it all moves together like a unit. And this is an example here of a patient who had pseudomembranous colitis.
So how do we overcome the enemy of, ultras, of, of bowel gas? Well, the first thing I do is um, I have the patient cross their right leg over their left leg, and we'll do this today with the models. Um, on my earlier demonstration, um, I forgot to do that, but I think it's important to do that, to put the right leg over the left leg as far as possible without the patient falling off the table. And then um, you're gonna push really hard. You're gonna push harder in the abdomen than you've ever pushed before with an ultrasound transducer today. But don't worry, the models are getting paid to tolerate that. Um, <laughs> they'll push you away if it hurts too much. Um, we also are gonna give the models fentanyl. We're gonna give them narcotics today, just kidding. No, but in, in, re in reality, this is what you do, okay? People say ultrasound is a very operator-dependent thing. Some people are good at finding the appendix, some people aren't. No. Appendicitis is a very fentanyl-dependent thing. You guys know what fentanyl is a narcotic? Short-acting lasts 20 minutes. We use it a lot in patients who have acute pain in the emergency department. I can give somebody a good slug of fentanyl, and it really does take the edge off their, their pain so that I can compress and get into their abdomen using ultrasound. It's a much more humane way to do than what we're going to do today to our models. Um, but the good news is, uh, when you have disease states of the intestine, there's less peristalsis, there's bowel wall thickening, there's less intraluminal gas, which makes abnormal intestine easy to see, easier to see than, norm, than, than normal intestine. So abnormal intestine like that pseudomembranous colitis picture you just saw, we, we could really deep see the outline pretty well of those uh, loops of bowel. When we have gas inside the wall of the bowel, this is a very abnormal condition. This tells us that um, an infection is produced so far that we're getting gas inside the wall of the bowel. We can see these granular appearance intra, intramural, mural means wall, as opposed to intraluminal, which means to see gas inside the lumen or center of the bowel is normal. But to see in the wall, that's always abnormal. This is an example of a combined picture of intramural over here intramural gas, always abnormal, versus intraluminal, which we expect to see, okay? Here's some more intramural gas, okay, over here. This is a patient who's got a very severe condition called necrotizing enterocolitis. We see air in the wall, intramural air. This is another patient that we had in the emergency department. This is all ascites right here. So ascites builds up when the liver starts to fail, fluid builds up, and we can actually see the intestine very well when ascites outlines the loops of bowel. And here we see intramural gas building up inside this person's um, bowel wall. Okay, switching gears now, we're gonna talk a little bit about something called small bowel obstruction. Very, very common emergency we see in the emergency department all over the hospital, small bowel obstructions. And basically, plain films can get you in trouble here because they can be inaccurate. Up to about 30% of the time, Plain films are not going to help you in somebody who's got a full-blown small bowel obstruction. It's for various reasons, but just uh, keep in mind that ultrasound may be the way to go here with a small bowel obstruction while you're waiting to get the definitive test, which is a CT scan. So somewhere between x-ray and CT lies ultrasound with its test characteristics. Um, and what you see with ultrasound is pretty easy to see, actually. If I've got a patient who's pretty distended, I just walk over with the ultrasound probe. They're vomiting. They've got all the clinical signs of small bowel obstruction. Well, this is what I see. I see these dilated loops here of small bowel. Notice the plique circularis going all the way across the bowel there. The walls are usually thickened, though sometimes in an early small bowel obstruction, the walls have yet to become thickened. And this is where it can excel over chest uh, abdominal x-rays is the fact that you could have a very proximal small bowel obstruction where um, the x-rays doesn't see it because the patient's been vomiting so much, there's no longer an air fluid level, and therefore the x-ray could miss it. Well, ultrasound can pick those up. And also there's something called a closed loop obstruction. You know what that is? A closed loop obstruction is where you have small bowel that's been um, twisted on both ends, and there's a, a section in between a closed loop where there's no air. It's just a small bowel obstruction without air in it. And without the air, you don't get the air fluid levels you see on, a, on an x-ray. And so that's how x-rays miss these, which we see very quite easily on, on an ultrasound. And so this is just another example here of the small bowel, the plique circularis going all the way across and with, it definitely has thickened wall. And if we look adjacent to it, there's even free fluid between two of these loops of bowel. When you see free fluid like that between two loops of bowel in a patient with a small bowel obstruction, that's a surgical emergency. The presence of free fluid means we need to go to the operating room 
now on this patient? Because you can have an early grade, early small bowel obstruction, or maybe a narcotic ileus where the bowel is just kind of slowing down, starting to get a little bit dilated. But when there's actually free fluid, that suggests microperforation, and that this patient needs to go to the operating room. Okay, switching gears. Finally, the appendix and the acute appendicitis very, very common, okay? It's the most common surgical abdominal emergency in North America. About a third of patients, though, don't have that classic presentation, which is generalized abdominal pain that then um, locates itself to the right lower quadrant, what we call McBurney's point, um, and associated with anorexia and um, elevated white blood cell count. Uh, that's a classic presentation I just described to you. I have patients coming in eating Cheetos who later go to the operating room for acute appendicitis and the pathology specimen comes out positive for appendicitis. So I've seen a lot of atypical presentations of appendicitis and that's where we have to turn to imaging. Now CT clearly has the best characteristics here, but doing a CT scan is about 500 chest x-rays worth of radiation. And when you're young in life, um, you have uh, more, your, your tissue is more radiosensitive and you have a longer time in which to absorb radiation throughout your life and radiation exposure at, to put your risk for cancer is a cumulative effect so we try to avoid um, unnecessary CT use especially in patients less than 35 years old and certainly when I have a kid in my ER 10, 12, 14 years old I really try to avoid getting CAT scan on them though sometimes I have to get it because the risk uh, or the benefit outweighs the risk now, if we could get good with ultrasound, though, and see a true appendicitis on ultrasound, we could avoid the need for a CT scan, and especially in a younger patient. The average age of somebody who gets appendicitis is 27 years old. So Terasawa, the author, did a meta-analysis uh, a long time ago, six years ago, back when the ultrasound machines weren't as good, and found out that in, in the hands of radiology, uh, ultrasound had a sensitivity of 86% and a specificity of 81%. And the reason for its low specificity is because we never see this on ultrasound. Feast your eyes on it, it's a normal appendix. I can only see it about 15 to 20% of the time. Um, although I think I might have seen one earlier today on Tyler when I was pre-scanning him. Um, so that's the problem. It's hard to see a normal, but to see the abnormal appendix, I'm going to show what those look like in a second, that's actually pretty good, which is why the sensitivity is a little bit better. This is an 18-year-old woman who had lower abdominal pain. We can see here this blind, tubular blind-ended um, structure here, nice thin walls, certainly less than 5 millimeters um, down there, right adjacent to her external iliac uh, artery seen right here. Now, when you look for appendicitis, what you're trying to do is you're trying to compress the abdominal wall musculature down to the psoas muscle. And if you wait for it and wait for it and keep compressing, keep compressing, eventually you'll see that little appendix um, pop its head out at you. And, um, and then as soon as it's there, it's gone again. So hopefully you were recording it. But it gets sandwiched between the abdominal wall musculature and the psoas muscle. It should be no bigger than six millimeters when it's normal. And occasionally, you can see an appendicolith, which translated means um, poop stone. So this is kind of what we do. Here's the abdominal wall musculature up here. Here's a loop of bowel right there, okay? This is the iliac vessel right there. And what we're doing is we're pushing really hard. So this muscle right here, this is the psoas muscle. The psoas muscle is actually coming up and coming into contact with the abdominal wall musculature right there. And there's loops of bowel that gets sandwiched between the psoas, which is a very long muscle. The psoas sandwiches the bowel. Now, if the bowel is normal, it just compresses, squirts out of the way like it is here. But if the bowel is abnormal, if it's acute appendicitis, then what happens is you get this round structure here that's more than six millimeters that lacks peristalsis that when you compress psoas all the way up to abdominal wall musculature, here's some abdominal wall musculature, probably abdominal oblique, here's rectus, this is psoas, it squishes that appendix there, and the appendix is a non-compressible tubular structure in the right lower quadrant that measures more than six millimeters. That's how you do it. That's the technique. This is, uh, here we're trying to identify the appendix. Here's our psoas muscle practically coming all the way to the abdominal skin. Uh, this patient's very, very thin. That's how we're able to do this. And yes, this is a lot easier in thin patients. And yes, this is a truly fentanyl dependent thing because look how much we're compressing this tissue. Now, if you have appendicitis, all these areas down here in the peritoneal cavity get inflamed. So, and it's, it's very painful to be compressing these things. This is the peritoneal lining right here. 
Okay, I can see that peritoneal lining very easily on ultrasound. Everything down here is all intestines and there's psoas muscle coming all the way up and coming in contact with abdominal wall musculature. Now I know what you're thinking. You're sitting in the audience going, I don't see what the heck he's talking about. I just see some stuff move around the screen. But when the probe is in your hands, there's some kind of weird feedbacky loop thing going on that makes this easier to see. So in this case, it was normal. We didn't see the appendix, and um, the patient actually ended up getting a CT scan, which was negative for appendicitis. And we called the patient back, and they were fine. This is the abdominal wall musculature here, and this blind-ended tubular structure right here that's non-compressible in the right lower quadrant measuring 8 millimeters is true acute appendicitis. And there's some psoas down here. We're pushing, we're squishing. Here's some part of the psoas here. There's another part down here. We're squishing the appendix up between psoas and abdominal wall musculature. Just another example of another patient with acute appendicitis. It starts to take on this characteristic blind-ended tubular structure. And I look at this both in transverse and I rotate the probe in a sagittal plane. But I gotta tell you, when I do find it, I feel like I'm so lucky. It's such a magical moment that I'm really careful to move the probe and I tell the patient not to move, and I'm like, really? That's when I'm really like paranoid I'm going to lose it on the screen because it's pretty exciting to see a true a positive appendicitis. That when I go from transverse to sagittal or from short to long axis on it, I'm really ginger how I move the probe. Here is uh, one last example of another patient with appendicitis. We can see here, this is the abdominal wall musculature. Again, this, this theme keeps coming up over and over again. Here's the psoas somewhere down here smooshing this appendix between the two muscle structures. I think psoas is actually over here too, I see over here. And um, this one's got a little fecalith right there, you see that? Which literally means poop stone right there. That's inside the appendix, and that's what happens, right? The little fecalith comes down, it obstructs the opening of the appendix, and then the appendix just starts to get larger and larger and larger, it can't drain its contents. And then finally the pressure inside the appendix gets higher than the ability for the blood vessels to to provide it with vasculature, and then you get ischemia, you get lack of blood flow to that appendix, and eventually the walls get thin and the pressure inside the appendix outweighs the ability of the wall to maintain its integrity, and the wall perforates, and the contents of the appendix spill out into the abdominal peritoneal cavity. And once that perforation occurs, surgery is often not of benefit, and you just give the patient antibiotics uh, for a couple of weeks and admit them to the hospital. Yes. There are risks that you can do to patients um, with ultrasound, such as dislodging a DVT. That does frighten me, but compressing an appendix, um, I, I don't think there's enough extrinsic pressure that you could perforate. I think really the true perforation comes from the, the inside getting ready to, to make it pop. Because yeah, we're pushing a lot of pressure and maybe I oversold that too much. We're not pushing so hard that we're causing a very local part of it to, to perforate. I mean, we're pushing enough just to kind of get the, the the muscle bellies to come together. So to summarize with the intestines, you want to have a nice layered appearance, um, it should be easily compressible, you should see intermittent peristalsis, and keep in mind that large intestine has a wall thickness less than four millimeters, and small intestine is somewhat thinner than that. Changing gears one last time, we're going to talk now about the gallbladder. Grace, if you want to hand those out while I'm doing the gallbladder. Um, we're going to have the indicator Indicate, indicator aimed towards the patient's head in a, in a sagittal plane, and then the patient's going to take a deep breath, and that's called the subcostal sweep, okay? And once you get the gallbladder in its long axis, you can then rotate the probe 90 degrees to get the gallbladder in its short axis. Once you insinuate the gallbladder in the long axis, you also need to uh, view it in the short axis. Uh, when you, once you do get the gallbladder in the long axis, you're going to fan through the gallbladder, like so, making sure you catch the entire gallbladder, looking for any type of pathology. After you're done with the long axis, you're going to rotate the probe 90 degrees from whatever axis you're in, like so, and you're going to view the gallbladder in the short axis. Again, you're going to fan through the entirety of the gallbladder, looking for any possible pathology. And so, in the short axis, this is what the gallbladder looks like. Now, I know you see a lot of anechoic structures on the screen here. We see, you know, we, well, we see this hypercoic structure here, which is what? the kidney, this is all the liver up here, and we see a circle here. What's this circle here? It's the IVC. Actually, we can kind of, I think, make out the aorta next to it here. Uh, maybe the spine shadow is somewhere down here. Not really exactly sure, but I do see that the most superficial or anterior or structure that's closest to the skin line that is anechoic, that is the gallbladder. 
And that's pretty much true. So when you're looking around the abdomen, when you find the, the closest thing to the skin that's anechoic, that's likely your gallbladder there. In young thing patients, we tend to find the gallbladder more lateral and anterior. In those patients, if you can't find it with the subcostal sweep or the X-7 approach, it's often helpful to take the indicator and really flatten it out against the abdomen. The indicator is pointed towards the patient's right. Uh, the probe itself is flattened out as much as you can. You kind of uh, fan through the gallbladder anterior to posterior as you work your way laterally. And oftentimes you'll find the gallbladder up in this area here. And in larger patients, it can be very difficult to find the gallbladder in that fashion. What you need to do is do what we call the X minus 7. In the X minus 7 approach, the X stands for the xiphoid process. The 7 stands for the 7 centimeters you're going to go to the right laterally. Place the probe perpendicular to the patient's skin and more often than not, you're going to find the gallbladder in this general area. And that's really, really helpful, actually. That's the trick. If I had to say one trick from this entire lecture today, when you're struggling with the gallbladder, which you will always struggle with the gallbladder, it can be a very difficult organ to find, um, go X minus 7. You know, X xiphoid process, go 7 centimeters lateral. Go, some people term this the intracostal view. In really big patients, sometimes you're X minus 10 or X minus 12 or X minus 40, something like that. But you get the idea. You're going between the ribs because this is the true art here of sonology is finding that gallbladder sometimes. And, I mean, I found the gallbladder all over the place. And sometimes in older patients, everything kind of sags down. I can see it down here. I found the gallbladder over here before in an older lady. So, I mean, this is generally speaking all the different locations you can you can dig around and find it. But when you find the gallstones, they're really fun to look at because they're echogenic, they shadow, they're gravitationally dependent. So if you move the patient around, the gallstones will move around on you. And for these reasons, makes ultrasound the test of choice. It's the most sensitive and specific imaging modality. It beats out CAT scan because it's often with a CAT scan, you miss on that one little cut, you miss the, uh, the gallstone. And I've got plenty of examples of that um, from the literature and anecdotally where ultrasound found stuff that the CAT scan missed, especially when it comes to, um, comes to gallstones. And uh, this is just another example here of the gallbladder wall. What happens during when a patient has ascites is that the acidic fluid gets into the wall of the gallbladder. So you know why people have ascites, right? The liver starts to fail and it doesn't make the proteins anymore, so it can't keep the fluid inside the vessels. It extravasates into the third space, which in this case is the peritoneal lining and the fluid then absorbs into the gallbladder wall, causing the gallbladder wall to be thickened. Now, normally a gallbladder wall should be less than three millimeters. And if somebody has acute cholecystitis or um, an acutely inflamed gallbladder, then in an infectious situation, the gallbladder wall gets thicker uh, than three millimeters. Certainly greater than five millimeters, patients going to the OR likely that day to have their gallbladder taken out. But ascites can just normally cause the gallbladder wall to thicken. And also a gallbladder, right after you eat any fatty food at all, okay? So if you have some uh, salad with any fat in it, I mean, it's amazing how the gallbladder will find any fat that you eat and will contract, right? Cholecystokinin gets released, it goes to the gallbladder and causes the gallbladder to contract down and secrete the bile into your gut to dissolve the fat. So what happens when that happens is the gallbladder contracts down and the wall itself appears falsely thickened, which is why if I'm really curious about a patient's gallbladder wall, I want to measure it. I try to do it if they haven't eaten for at least four or five hours. That's the reason why we do that sometimes. So it depends what the models had for lunch. Most of the time, it's almost impossible to eat zero fat. So usually their gallbladder is a little contracted, making them a little bit hard to find. The other thing we look for sometimes in the liver that you will, you will stumble across are just masses. This is an example here of some solid tumors here in the liver. Um, this is the diaphragm over here, and we can just see there's some tumors going on here. So if you do see that, that's obviously something that you'd want to tell somebody about. Finally, um, this is the last slide. Just uh, today during the hands-on session, what we're going to do is we're going to get the kidney in the long and short axis, okay? Um, I don't necessarily need you to measure the bladder volume because that takes a little bit to stop and drop calipers and stuff. You can drop a caliper or two if you want, but but I want you to demonstrate how you would do it at least to the instructors. You're going to mow the lawn, compress, um, get that rectus abdominal muscle to come all the way down to come in contact with the psoas muscle. And, um, and then I want you to show the gallbladder's long and short axis.
Any questions about this talk? Okay. Yes. I don't. Yeah, that's a great question. That comes up all the time. Why would you put the um, right leg over the left leg? Um, I think uh, what it, it it has an effect on the psoas muscle, brings the psoas muscle maybe a little bit more anteriorly. Um, that's one of the things I can think. It uh, it does something too with the abdominal, the the lateral abdominal wall muscles maybe too brings those in a little bit tighter, so you can use them for compressibility. Brings the contents of the abdominal cavity, the intestines, a little bit more anterior, so you're compressing anteriorly and not laterally coming from the side. That's the only thing I can think of. I, I get that question all the time, and that's how I think of it, is just it brings everything a little bit more, brings it together a little tighter into the abdominal uh, compartment. 